The National Museum of the United States Air Force is located on Wright-Patterson Air Force Base just outside of Dayton, Ohio. And we are currently in the Air Power Gallery or the World War II Gallery of the National Museum. And this is the beginning of the gallery. It starts with America basically getting beaten pretty hard by the Japanese after Pearl Harbor as the Japanese pushed their way back and pushed us back into the Philippines and fought into the Philippines. And this very part of the museum is where the United States begins to reassert itself and take control of the war effort in the Pacific. The exhibit behind me, the Doolittle Tokyo Raiders, this is the turning point of the war. It was the mission that took place on the 18th of April, 1942. It's a fairly well known mission and it's the one that actually turned the complete tide of war in the Southwest Pacific. Up to this point, the Japanese had been reeling off victory after victory after victory, and the American forces and the British forces had been pushed back and pushed back and pushed back, and the Japanese were nearing Australia. The American fleet was in shambles in Pearl Harbors, and we were down to just a few carriers left. At this point, the Navy and the U.S. Army Air Forces worked together to create a joint operation to give the world's first example of America's global reach and global power. They tried to find a way to use bombers to strike Japan. Well, when the Philippines fell, that really was no longer an option. But the possibility of putting small bombers onto aircraft carriers and flying close enough to be able to attack Tokyo or other military targets within Japan presented itself. And the Army and the Navy looked at the idea together and they decided upon using a B-25 Mitchell, such as the one directly behind me because it had the range, it could carry the bomb load, and they knew it had the takeoff range that they might be able to get it off of an aircraft carrier's deck. They asked one of the world's greatest pilots of all time, Lieutenant Colonel, later General, Jimmy Doolittle, to see if it was possible, and Jimmy Doolittle said it was feasible. They presented the idea to the President and was received permission to do so because this was an extremely risky attack. We were down to just a few carriers, our surface fleet was in serious trouble from the bombing at Pearl Harbor, and the Japanese outnumbered us greatly in aircraft carriers, and we were going to risk two of our aircraft carriers, one to carry the bombers, one to provide support and air cover during the mission. We took a great gamble and sent 16 B-25 bombers on the USS Hornet and launched them toward the Japanese home islands to attack military targets. The task force, after it left Pearl Harbor and it met up with the other part of the task force that was bringing the B-25s from San Francisco Harbor, they met up in mid-Pacific and moved their way toward Japan, and finally the carriers, the two carriers, and a couple of carrier uh, escort air ships, the cruisers, made a fast run toward Japan, but they were spotted by Japanese patrol boats before they had the opportunity to take off. The plan was to take off fly across Japan, attack the targets, and then fly on into China, land the airplanes, and turn the aircraft over to the Chinese forces to continue the fight against the Japanese from the, Japanese, from the Chinese mainland. Well, when they were discovered too early, the airplanes, even though they carried special modifications and carried special fuel tanks inside, were not going to be able to take off, attack Japan, and fly all the way to their, where they were supposed to land in China. The crews took off knowing that they would not reach their final destination. They, they, uh, they understood this, and the dangers were increasing by the moment that they flew, uh, using gasoline every second, using every drop of air fuel on board their aircraft. But what happened was, as they finished their mission, they all finished their missions. Uh, of the 16, 15 continued flying toward China. One turned off and went northward toward Vladivostok, and it actually landed, but the Soviets uh, they were not at war with Japan at the time, and so they commandeered the aircraft. They interned the crew, and the crew was later allowed to escape and come back to the United States before the war was over. The other 15 aircraft never made it. One or two crashed right along the Chinese coast. Uh, one crew was, died in the crash. Others were killed along the way as their planes crashed. But by and large, they flew as far as they could toward Chinese forces, friendly Chinese forces, and parachuted. They thought they would be coming over China during the daytime from the original plans, 
but they had to take off early, which meant they flew over and they had to bail out at night. It was much safer to simply bail out of the aircraft than to try to land it at night. Of the 80 men, eight were captured. Of the eight, three were executed. One man died of sickness in the Japanese prisoner of war camp. As you may well imagine, they were not particularly well treated by the Japanese. The three who were executed, they had a, a pretty much of a mock trial, never told them what they were being tried for, and summarily executed them. But the four who survived, survived to bring back the tale of how the others, and they served, four of those men survived the war. Of the others, several were killed in the raid, the others went back to fight the war, several more died during fighting and combat during World War II, but they spread across the entire globe because this was a global war and it was a global mission for the U.S. Army Air Forces, and they played their part through the rest of the war to carry the war to our enemies and to win the Second World War. Jimmy Doolittle promised all of his men on board the USS Hornet that when they got to China, he was going to throw them a party, the biggest party they'd ever seen. Well, since they all didn't make it, they held off, and they, the Raiders kind of would run into each other periodically through the war, and they'd have small parties, but they had their first big party in December of 1945. And it was kind of to celebrate Jimmy Doolittle's birthday. It was kind of the party that Jimmy Doolittle had promised. It was partially a reunion, and apparently they had a, a really good time. And they decided, we need to do this again. So it started a series of annual reunions. And in 1959, the city of Tucson purchased 80 goblets to give to the Raiders, and they had the men's names engraved, one way for the goblet to be turned up correctly, and the other way to be turned upside down to indicate that that Raider had passed away. The Raiders decided they would have a toast with the last two survivors to all those who had gone before. And they had a bottle of special cognac that was matching the date of Jimmy Doodle's birth date. The four surviving Doodle Raiders decided it was time to go ahead and have the final toast. Three of them were able to come to the National Museum of the United States Air Force. The fourth was just too ill to travel at the time, and he watched over the internet and participated over the internet and took a, a toast with the guy, with the Doodle Raiders. And they finished what was the final goblet ceremony. Now, it's undetermined what will happen to these four goblets because the four men are still alive. I don't know if they're going to be turned over for all of them or leave the four just to show that the last four men were the ones who made the final toast. But the Raiders themselves are in charge. We'll do what they ask us to do. To help visitors understand the story of the Doolittle Raiders and the significance of what they accomplished, we have quite a few artifacts on display. We have some of the flight jackets the men wore and some of the equipment they carried with them and they brought back. Some of them actually wore it for the rest of the war when they fought in North Africa and such. We also have the camera that was used to take the photographs from the American's vantage point of the Doolittle Tokyo Raid. So without that one camera, we would have no images whatsoever because the cameras at the back of the airplane that would be taking the photographs of the strikes were lost with the aircraft. So we are fortunate to have that on display. The aircraft itself is of the same type used by Jimmy Doolittle. We have uh, mannequins representing Doolittle, Michener, and uh, a man named Dick Cole, who's one of the surviving Doolittle Raiders, uh, leaning out the window of the aircraft. Then in the back, a visitor can look at the mannequins showing how the bombs were being loaded, the aircraft was being prepared for that mission. So we're trying to tell a broader story than just the mission, but it was an entire effort from the United States Navy and the U.S. Army Air Forces to carry out this assault. It's a long way from San Francisco to Tokyo, and this is something that most people would have never thought possible to launch a raid that distance. But now we have grown to expect the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Air Force, and the U.S. Army and the Marines to do this on a regular basis. This is the beginning of an entire mindset of American military and political thought.